Would you create a digital version of yourself that could live on after you died? What about an interactive avatar of a loved one? What happens when technology shapes our most painful experiences of death, loss, and separation? Is digital mourning possible? And what if we merged with machines? Would it still be us? These are big, chunky questions which sci-fi has never shied away from. So, with the launch of our latest report, AI and the Afterlife, we thought we'd do something different and review three films that deal with the fascinating question of what happens when technology and death collide. Let's dive in. Starting things off, we have Be Right Back, an episode from Season 2 of Black Mirror. After the unexpected death of her partner, Ash, Martha is signed up, without her consent, to a service that supposedly allows her to communicate with him through a chatbot. Like existing grief bots, the bot Martha ends up talking to is trained on her partner's data. His texts, posts, emails. The more the data, the better the simulation, the more credible the user experience. Here's Martha's friend with a pitch that, as you'll see, is woefully ill-timed. It's also a good summary of how existing grief tech, as it's sometimes called, is marketed. I can sign you up to something that helps. It helped me. It will let you speak to him. I know he's dead, but it wouldn't work if he wasn't. And don't worry, it's not some crazy spiritual thing. He was a heavy user. He'd be perfect. Please, shut up. I mean, it's still in beta, but I've got an invite. Please, shut up. You won't even have to do anything. I'll just assign- SHUT UP! Initially hesitant, Martha slowly gets used to the bot who speaks and jokes just like Ash. It's worth noting that she starts using the bot from a position of vulnerability. She is bereaved and pregnant, so all the more susceptible to the simulation's lures. But chatting through a screen isn't enough to feel the presence of her loved one. So she feeds the bot more data and upgrades to audio. While clearly an improvement, it's still not enough. Eventually, at Ash's suggestion, she takes it to the next level. A synthetic body double in which Ash can be, well, reincarnated. Who said religion and magic disappeared in the age of technology? For a while, Martha's life seems to be back on track. She's gone back to her digital drawing board, she's an artist, and sex is better than ever. The only problem is she's checked out of her social life, and the reincarnated Ash is, well, too much of a pushover. In a moment of rage and clarity, she says, You're not enough of him. You're nothing. And in a heart-hitting scene towards the end of the episode, Martha tests the simulation to see if it's really Ash, so she pretends she wants to jump off a cliff. The simulation doesn't pick up on the clues. She tells it to jump, but it refuses, saying Ash had never expressed suicidal thoughts or self-harm. The dialogue is tense. Yeah, well, you aren't you, are you? That's another difficult one, to be honest with you. You're just a few ripples of you. There's no history to you. You're just a performance of stuff that he performed without thinking, and it's not enough. Another moment of clarity. An embodied simulation of a person is just a performance, and it's not enough of him. Or is it? Rewatching the episode, the final bit caught me by surprise. It throws a big spanner as the story jumps forward a few years. Ash and Martha's daughter is around, and it's her birthday. Martha hands her a slice of cake, which she takes to the attic, which turns out to be the bot's new home. It seems that a few ripples of someone, a hollow performance, can be enough. All in all, Be Right Back is a powerful portrayal of the lure of technologies that promise to give us something of the presence of our loved ones back, especially when we're vulnerable and our defenses are low. It also shows the lengths we might be willing to go just to stay in touch. Next up, we have The Virtual Llama by Owl in Space, a story about two sisters, one of which decides to upload her mind. Why? Well, this is presented as the environmentally conscious thing to do in the context of overpopulation and overconsumption. It's also supposedly the next step in humanity's evolution. The mood is melancholic, even mournful. And while the film is clearly about mind uploading, it's also indirectly 
a subtle case for the body as essential to being human. The setting of the story, a lush rapeseed field with an old tree in the middle, suggests a feast for the senses. This quiet celebration of the body comes through powerfully in a scene at the end which feels pulled straight out of a Terence Malick film. But the body also comes up in the dialogue between the sisters. How has it been there? I've been reading a lot. Did you know the decay of our bodies is what gives us a sense of time? And it feels like an eternity since I saw you. Sis. Hold Fred. And Betty. <laughs> it's a shame I couldn't bring Fred with me. Have you met anyone? Like friends? Yeah, um, like a partner. No, and I'm not sure I want to. But you always wanted to be a mum. I know. I read the body is what gives us most of our desires. And then there's this powerful scene that sums up the virtual llama's thoughts on uploading. Francis, is that you? Could I see my body? What? Are you sure? This is not how I imagined eternity to be. At only nine minutes, the virtual llama packs a philosophical punch and raises all the important questions about what it means to be human, what makes a relationship authentic, and whether living as a disembodied mind is an afterlife worth pursuing. Last up, with an A-list cast and a hefty budget, Transcendence is an ambitious sci-fi thriller from 2014 about the deepest motivations for AI research, the possibility and perils of merging with machines, the existential risk of AI, the nature of identity and consciousness, and much more. The story pivots around a leading AI researcher, Dr. Will Castor, who is on a quest to develop superintelligent artificial general intelligence. AGI, or in his words, transcendence. Dr. Castor? Yes, sir. You have a question. So, you want to create a god? Your own god? That's a very good question. Um, isn't that what man has always done? Castor ends up being shot by anti-tech violent extremists, or neo-Luddites, as the film calls them. With days to live, his partner Evelyn, with the help of his colleague Max, successfully uploads him to a superintelligent quantum computer. As a mind that's supposedly been set free, connected to the internet, Will builds an impressive research facility and makes a series of technological breakthroughs in nanotechnology and synthetic biology. The point of it all is to fix humans eradicate suffering, and reverse planetary decay. Here are two scenes where you can hear Will in his own words. They'll be scared at first, but once they see what the technology can do, I think that they will embrace it, and I think it will change their lives. These people are suffering, Evelyn. They have no hope. And I'm able to fix them. But there are others who don't understand. It's time for everybody to see. Acting increasingly like a tech god, his ambitions grow bigger and bigger, 
as do the fears and concerns of his former colleagues, who make it their mission to stop the whole thing. A key question that comes up at several points in the film is whether, separated from his body, the upload is truly Will. Morgan Freeman's character answers that, given how much his mind has evolved, he's not sure it really matters anymore. Evelyn stands by the digital Will, but his former colleague Max and FBI agent Buchanan see only a digital replica driven by unchecked hubris. The message of transcendence is a little muddled in the end. It's not at all clear whether Will's merging with technology elevates or distorts his humanity, and whether what emerges is a digital god or a demon. Warnings about rogue AI peppered throughout the film clash with an ending that casts Will's efforts in a much more favorable light. An expert genuinely trying to make the world a better place. If only humans wouldn't be afraid of what they don't understand. So that's it. Lots of things to ponder at the intersection of technology, death, and human experience. And I'd love to know what you think. How do you feel about using AI to simulate a loved one's presence after they've died? Creepy? Or comforting? Or is it just more complicated than that? And thinking about mind uploading, can we expect technology to one day capture the essence of a person and offer a meaningful afterlife? Does the idea of living as a digital entity appeal to you or does it unsettle you? And are we headed towards a future where we merge with machines? And if so, is that something to celebrate or be deeply concerned about? Let us know what you think in the comment section below and go check out our latest report, AI and the Afterlife, from digital mourning to mind uploading, which explores all of this and more. Link is in the description below. Thanks.